In this video, we're going to review the science and psychology behind why you crave certain foods in times of stress, sorrow, and even joy. My goal is to help you understand why we have a hard time saying no to high calorie foods and give you tools to better manage your temptations. Welcome to another episode of Advice from a Jackass. My name is Romani Malco. I am the founder of The Pep, the People's Empowerment Platform. This is the place where growth-oriented people go to explore the possibilities of holistic success. We cover everything from psychological health to financial integrity and everything in between. Let's get it started. Have you ever wondered why you crave that cookie at the end of a stressful meeting? Do you find yourself reaching for something sweet during a good movie or a good show? If this is you, you are not alone. Research shows that emotions drive many people's eating habits. When was the last time you craved a stalk of broccoli or a nice big head of cabbage at the end of a stressful day? Doesn't ring a bell? Studies show that during periods of stress, even make-believe lab stress, we reach for foods high in carbohydrates, particularly simple sugars. We see quick sources of fuel when we sense that things are getting tough. One theory is we inherited this survival mechanism from our ancestors, who needed high energy levels to ward off predators and prepare themselves for times of scarcity. However, people reach for comfort foods even when they are happy, simply seeking additional joy. Our conditioning that was once intended to help support our ability to survive in the wild now sustains a complex habit of feeding stress and or celebration with high calorie foods. Our emotions play a pivotal role. We associate comfort foods with feelings of consolation or well-being. These foods offer emotional satisfaction that exceeds caloric energy. The problem is they tend to have high caloric content, typically by way of sugar or fat. The foods we consume directly affect how our brains react. And the reaction to sugar and fats is an increased desire to consume more of them. Our brains respond to fats and carbohydrates by releasing dopamine and corticosteroids, which then tells our brain we need to consume more of those type foods. And stress and repetition exacerbate this vicious cycle. And I think that in America, we might have the easiest access to highly refined and processed foods. And we use those foods as an ineffective stress management technique. High carbohydrate foods, to some extent, help dull the mental toll of stress. And our bodies seek our protection from perceived threat by consuming an overabundance of calories. We get stressed, we eat. We get heavier and more stress than the cycle continues. Preferred comfort foods vary based on age, gender, and socioeconomic status. There are some comfort foods that fall under the category of soul food in the black community. These foods are typically associated with historically black foods in the South. Soul food is typically cheaper to make and are dense in calories, so they provide the greatest feelings of satisfaction. And you know what? There are so many different communities across the world, and all of those communities have their version of comfort food. But the United States is quite unique in being such a rich country how many communities have little access to fresh food. These communities, sometimes referred to as food deserts, forces poor urban communities to rely on unhealthy options, which is why so many underserved communities turn to canned food, processed food, and fast food. But that's not really what this video is about. We start making psychological connections and emotional attachments to food early in life. Our experience reinforces those choices as we turn to food in times of hardship. Adults with eating disorders typically start those disordered eating patterns early in adolescence, and the behaviors stay with them into adulthood. As children, we start learning the foods we're going to turn to as adults when in need of comfort. Research indicates that sugars and fats interact differently with each person's brain chemistry. One person can consume the same amount of sugar and fat as another person without having the desire to overindulge. A study in the Journal of Neuroscience linked a reliance on comfort foods to the production of serotonin and noradrenaline. Higher levels of noradrenaline cause us to want to consume more food, where higher levels of serotonin production are linked to smaller appetites. Those who handle stress better don't tend to develop the same addictive relationships to food. Take a moment to think about your coping strategies when confronted with a difficult event or memory. Do you find yourself needing food to cope with the emotional work or anxiety? There are a variety of socioeconomic factors that make breaking up with your favorite comfort food extremely difficult. The economics of healthy eating cannot be denied. Eating healthy foods simply costs more. Purchasing and preparing foods that are not loaded with saturated fats and carbs costs time and money. And if you're living in the food desert, more than likely there ain't no rows and rows of money trees. Hey, listen, and it ain't just America, okay? Cultures all over the world have their known or chosen comfort foods, which they will not part with despite knowing the potential health risks. The emotional connection these foods have to our past is too strong to give up altogether. One thing that I've had to come to terms with over the last 15, 20 years of my life, especially when you have someone that you love and you see them making these unhealthy choices and their health just constantly deteriorating, is that most of us are going to choose our addictions over our lives. The greatest challenge facing health 
health advocates across the country is a simple fact. There is a lack of quality education to help people make educated choices about food. There is very little nutritional education provided in public schools or in communities. So healthy eating practices are not passed on as a skill set. I think I spit when I talk. Y'all saw that, but don't edit it out. Keep it. They need to see that. That's the reality. That's the real. The long-term impacts of emotional eating are suspected to be a major contributing factor to obesity and its secondary health concerns facing Americans. And y'all know when we say secondary health concerns of obesity, we are talking about diabetes. The research is ongoing, but the link between poor stress management and the need to consume high caloric food seems evident. The psychological research completed on the matter has not shown a way to completely break away from the foods that we are emotionally attached to. The key, according to fitness experts, is regular exercise and moderation in food. The ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, a leading health and fitness research organization, says that with a healthy diet, people can better deal with their stress, weight management, and overall health without having to break ties from the foods that they grew up loving. The ACSM also advocates eating a balanced diet of whole foods and engaging in about 180 minutes of light to moderate exercise per week. And once again, if you're digging the content, please share the content. I'm not asking you to subscribe or hit the like button. What I am asking you to do is follow me at the pep. Just go to petrequest.com and request an invite. This way, if any of these social media platforms have a change in algorithm, I'm still able to say, yo, I just dropped a dope video about blah, 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 and I can send it directly to you. Then you can go look at it on YouTube or Facebook or wherever the hell you follow me at. I hope this makes sense to you. But now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the advice from a jackass. Look, I'm going to keep it 100 and I have a funny feeling that I'm going to upset a lot of people, especially the fitness and health experts out there. But speaking from personal experience, I have never been able to make an effective change in my diet or my exercise habits until I addressed my psychological issues. And let me explain what I mean. Let's say you've gone through early childhood trauma. Let's say you're carrying that trauma with you. Let's say you live in an environment that promotes a lot of negative and you have not yet been able to communicate it or relieve yourself of the emotional and psychological burden that comes with that. Until we address those things, changing our diet and our overall health will remain an uphill battle. I used to be a very angry person. And a lot of it is because I had gone through these things in my childhood that I wasn't aware was trauma. I would try to find ways to calm this discomfort within me. Psychological discomfort. I didn't understand how it fed into my overindulgence in all other areas of my life. I just kept distracting myself and I just kept feeding myself. So I could feed myself food. I could feed myself sex. I could feed myself alcohol. I could feed myself TV. But the point is, is that I was constantly trying to distract myself and create these endorphin rushes to supplement this void that I was feeling inside of myself. Am I telling you to not go to the gym? No, I think that's part of it. Am I telling you to not at least attempt to change your diet? No, I'm not telling you to stop any of that. What I'm saying is that in order for it to stick, in order for it to be effective, you have have to address the psychological issues. Because many of you have heard me talk about in my podcast is that until you address those psychological issues, you are more than likely going to sabotage any level of success you are able to obtain. Oh, and if you like this content, please do me a favor and share. Now, getting back on track, the foods we crave carry more than just calories and grams of sugar. They tend to have an emotional connection to our past. Years of mental preconditioning and the cascade of neurochemistry that occur after consuming high caloric foods result in satisfaction. Research has shown that these foods stimulate more serotonin to be released in parts of the brain that are associated with emotional regulation, the reward centers. Despite the temporary pleasant feelings that comfort foods bring to us, we need to remember that these foods need to be consumed sparingly and reserved for special occasions. They tend to be calorically dense and are known to be contributing factors in metabolic diseases such as diabetes, high cholesterol, and obesity. Knowing that stress and trauma will push us to seek out these comfort foods, we need to make a concerted effort to manage our stress and to manage our psychological trauma. I urge anyone who is attempting to make a change in diet or their overall lifestyle, I assure you that address psychological trauma is a key component to having a successful experience. Again, if I'm going too fast and you want this in a nice, neat document, just go to peprequest.com and click the little button that says free download and I will make sure to send you a link to the document, okay? Now, I'm asking you a question and I'm not gonna judge you, but what foods do you find yourself using to satiate yourself emotionally? Or are you even aware that you do it? What I really wanna know is if this video inspired you to make any changes in 
in your life? And maybe did it provide you with any information that you think might help you have better success in making those dietary changes? If so, share the video. And also don't forget to follow me on the PEP because when people change their algorithms and folks wanna say that they got a change in policy, that won't stop me from notifying you of dope videos just like this one. You can go to petrequest.com and if you want this whole thing written out in a nice document that you can keep for yourself, go to petrequest.com, click that little button that says free download and I will make sure to send that link to you. Anyway, my name is Romney Malco. I am the founder of the PEP, the People's Empowerment platform and this concludes another episode of advice from a jackass